The high-spirited horses and their gentlemen riders might catch your attention as you take a moment from your chores and watch the dust rise up along the road in the rolling hills of Goodyear County back in 1876. A bus tour was organized by Lauren Evanrood of Cannon Falls to track the gang as they headed to their ill-fated robbery of the Northfield Bank on September 7, 1876. Some of the stories handed down through the years have been compiled by local historian Bob Roll of Kenyon. Let's climb on board the bus and listen to Bob build a case. old member of the community here by the name of Vince Benson, and he was a bit of a historian too. And he told me, he says, you know, Jesse James camped in your property. Yeah, all right. And, uh, I thanked him for the knowledge, but I was skeptical. But it did put a seed in to check and see if we, if that could be sold. And obviously, uh, it proved out that it could very well be sold. a horse any faster than a walk, they throw up dust and mud. And if you're trying to keep your clothes clean underneath, you wear these dusters. And the duster gets dirty. Now if you ever watch horse races in wet ground or so on on TV, you'll see them horses and the riders. In fact, they, uh, the jockeys wear goggles because there's so much mud and dirt and thrown up by the horse. That's the purpose of these white dusters. I had one and I was going to wear it today. However, I outgrew it. <laughs> That's another thing when they, various people tell you that they bought horses at this site or that site in Minnesota. Highly unlikely. Uh, you got eight riders on high quality saddle horses. In other words, they were thoroughbred crosses. They were generally called military horses, military type horses. And that's not a type of horse that would have been in this area. Uh, most people in this area did not ride horses. They used uh, wagons, uh, moved by horses, and the primary beast of burden at that time would probably be oxen. Bear in mind, these guys are out of Missouri and they're expert horsemen. So they were looking for speed and responsiveness. Sometime after that, we get them coming into Goodyear County. significance of that is they allegedly had their some of their horses reshot at this site. Water troughs to water horses. Uh, apparently there are these water troughs and I think they were more farm tanks. Uh, farmers had to have access to water their horses too without going through their livestock yards. So they were accessible to people off the road to the water their horses as they were moving now, as we come up on Hayter, you'll see 52 up here. 52 generally follows the old stage line from Dubuque to St. Paul. Uh, Hayter was a stage stop at one time. Uh, and what I mean by a stage stop, his horses had to be switched out because they tired out. And 
uh, I think it was 12 miles, but I might be wrong in that. Every 12 miles, they need a stage dock to switch these horses. And they'd switch them, and then uh, uh, the passengers could get out and stretch their legs, get something to eat, get something to drink if they wished. There was a hotel here, post office, general store, I think another blacksmith shop. Now this is a site of a, a Jemsey farm at that time. Uh, Jesse James, uh, depending on which historical society you believe, uh, bought oats or bought horses. And as I explained on the horses, I doubt they bought horses. I think they bought oats. Because a half a mile west here, uh, as I chatted a bit, is my property where they allegedly camped. Those type of horses didn't do well grazing. They needed horses, I mean oats, to uh, maintain their uh, vitality. They had to have grain. I live just down the road. I live on the old Hesedal farm. And in talking with the neighbors and listening to local lore, uh, there was an old shanty down on a creek just north here and some of the older gentlemen remember hearing stories of the James gang camping down at that shanty. Uh, to the south of us here is Aspen and another mile or so past that is County 30 and it goes to the west. And I think we're going to go by this farm. It's the old Chose farm. It's K-J-O-S. And I'm good friends with the great-grandson of the Chose family. And he remembers his great-grandmother telling him stories about the James gang stopping there to water the horses and get feed for the horses. So Bob is right on the money with the local lore that's been told around here for a year, a hundred years or better. Thank you. At this site of Norway, there was a young fellow by the name of Rasmus Granbull, and there's still a relative of him in the area. The Jesse James stopped, part of the crew did, and asked where the Brecky Bridge was. And he told them, and they asked how to get to Northfield. He further gave them some instructions, and they threw him a quarter in, which would have been a lot of money in those days. I'm leaving the District 113 school. In the evening of August 27th, we have camping on my place. And this would be August 28th in this area. The, uh, I can only document them about a year in Cannon Falls. Then the interesting thing, uh, he gets shot. Northfield. He gets shot by Manning, I believe it was, and some of you firearms interest people here, uh, as Manning shot him about half a block away using a 4570 Remington rolling block rifle. And another law of Skiles travels to Northfield to identify the body. And he positively identifies the body and he tells the people that if this is Stiles, he'll have a scar under his left arm. And upon examination, yes, he had a scar on his left arm. So to me, this is very positive identification. Now, his father came from Dakota Territory to identify the body and he says it wasn't his son. And I don't really know how to explain that, other than maybe he didn't want to pay for a burial, or maybe he was ashamed to have his son involved with uh, criminals. The weapon he used, if you people are into weapons, 23, I think, was a Smith carbine. We were going to be out of that, uh, and that was used, that was a surplus military one, where you see this, but, uh, uh, used by the cavalry during the Civil War. And it was rather unique because it was a uh, cartridge loaded rifle and the cartridge was made up of a, a rubber material. Both uh, Civil War generals, as I understand it, 
remember one was uh, <clears throat> some type of reconstruction official over New Orleans, and the other one was a reconstruction governor of Mississippi. And uh, he had to get out of Mississippi because they were going to tar and feather him. It was always a puzzle to me why they went past. And they went to Mankato, ended up in Mankato, allegedly to try and rob some banks there. And there was a big crowd in, uh, around one of the banks they were going to rob in Mankato. And they uh, thought that they were discovered, so they decided that they wouldn't attempt it. And the other reason is there was three banks in Mankato. That meant the wealth was spread around three different banks in the area. So that was a, a downer for him too. And I was puzzled for many times whether this was accurate, <coughs> excuse me, of them going to Mankato. And our good bus driver here says, well, maybe they wanted to scoop out an escape route. And that's also what my son Matt speculated. Maybe I think exactly. their focus at all the time was on this Northfield Bank. And I think they're more or less exploring escape routes when they went west. There's many, many stories about Jesse James, and a few of them are actually true. Yep. One thing is, the floor that you are walking on, the same floor, the robbers. Well, you're stepping right in the same footsteps as the robbers. Same floor. Clock is set at five minutes to two, which was the exact time of the robbery, and it's to September 7th on that original clock. Um, the vault is original. This table plays a big part of the story. It's original. It's Bob Younger and Frank James. And here is the hero of our story, Joseph Lee Haywood, who was working as the cashier, the acting cashier that day. All right, so these three guys come swaggering in with their long dusters. They try to scare people. That's their whole motivation. Frighten people to do what they want them to do. Swaggering in here, swaggering in, whip out their guns. Okay, this is a stick up. They do a lot of swearing and yelling, but I don't. Anyway, they swear and scream and yell. They're experienced bank robbers. One thing they have to know, who is the cashier? Cashier is the guy who can open the safe. Usually only the cashier. Might be, other people might know the combination, but they're looking for the cashier. So, they're already, now there's three guys working back here, and you can see there's not a lot of space. These three guys jump over, leap over the, leap over the counter here. Now they're back here, and they're asking right away. They ask, Frank Wilcox is working the Lonzo Bunkers, Joseph Lee Hayward. They ask Wilcox, you the cashier? Says no. Bunkers, you the cashier? No. They ask Wilcox, who's suspiciously standing near the safe, are you the cashier? He does the first of four very brave things. He says no. Now, technically speaking, he was just the acting cashier. Real cashier was in Philadelphia, for which I'm sure he was very grateful. Uh, but he was a cashier that day, but he said no. Okay, now the robbers don't know what to do. Usually somebody says, I'm the cashier, here's the money. Now they don't know what to do. They're very confused. And rumor has it that they've been tipping a few local bars. Don't rob banks if you're buzzed. Good thing to know. Uh, they did a lot of stupid things, many stupid things. Uh, so here's another stupid thing. They always know that there's cash in some drawers. So they start whipping open, they have a bag like this, you know, they're going to put cash in. They start whipping open drawers. Ironically enough, they thought they opened all the drawers. They missed the one with $3,000. Hello, so that was still there. So they weren't even paying attention very much. Okay, so now what happens is though, Charlie Pitts notices that the vault is open. Remember J.S. Allen, if you remember from the street, he had just come out of the bank. So the vault is slightly open. So Charlie Pitts goes charging over to the vault, starts to go into the vault, Joseph Lee Haywood does the second brave thing. He starts to close Charlie Pitts into the vault. Charlie Pitts' his arm sticks out. He comes out. He's really mad. He whips out his gun. He's going with the butt end of his gun now. He's threatening, threatening Haywood. He says, no, I know you're the cashier, and I know you have this. You better open that safe right now. Haywood does a third brave thing. He says, I can't. It has a time lock. Well, it did have a time lock, but it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. They didn't have a time lock on. Pitts knew that, too. Okay, so what do I have on the time lock now? Blah, 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 bl
Hayward does a fourth grade thing. They haven't heard any gunshots yet outside. He's going to warn the people on the street. So Joseph Lee Hayward yells, murder, murder. That does it. Pace is so ticked off. Smashes Hayward in the head. Down with a concussion. Unconscious. Well, great. Can't open the safety. He's unconscious, can he? So now they're going to think maybe these two guys know something. Bob Hepburn was watching Wilcox in the bunkers. That was his job. They had them sit kneeling down like this, watching the whole thing. So, uh, Pitts tries a tactic they used in some other robberies. Drags Joseph Lee Haywood's unconscious body into the vault here. And he takes his gun and says, I'm going to shoot him if you don't tell me the combination. What if he's got to know the combination? Blah, blah, blah. Nothing. He shoots, but he shoots into the vault. He doesn't shoot him. Okay, nothing yet. Okay, I'm going to slit his throat. Whips out a knife. They did this in a, in a train robbery when it's scared to scare people. Okay, I'm going to slit his throat. You don't talk. Yeah, pretends to slit his throat. Doesn't really. All this drama, Wilcox and Bunkers did do a thing, but Bob Younger stopped to watch them. <laughs> Bad idea. Bunkers gets up, runs out the back door. Charlie Pitts is like, oh, idiot. So he runs after Bunkers, shoots him in the shoulder. So one of the tellers had shot in the shoulder. Meanwhile now, they're hearing gunshots all over outside. So Cole Younger clops right up to the door with his horse and yells, get out, they're killing us all. Bob Younger leaps up, out the door. Charlie Pitts comes in from shooting Bunkers. He's out the door. Now. What happens next? For years and years, we didn't know who. We will never know why. Joseph Lee Haywood is coming too. He's on this very table. He starts pushing himself up, knocking the cobwebs out of his head. All right? Almost conscious again. Frank James didn't leave with the others. He had heard all those shots. All we can think of is maybe he thought they killed the there, Jesse was dead. That's all we can possibly think why he would do this. He takes his gun, puts it right up against Joseph Lee Hayward's head, bang! Shoots him in cold blood. They got $26.86 and they killed somebody. This was not very brilliant. So now as we leave it, we've got Bill Chadwell out on the street dead. We have Clell Miller out on the street dead. And now Joseph Lee Hayward. But before we put him at rest, why did he do it? Plenty of other cashiers have been perfectly willing to give the money to the robbers. Well, he knew a couple things. Some of those southern towns that they had robbed with northern money in the banks, presumably, they became ghost towns. All the town money, all the merchant money, all the farmer's money's there. Money's gone, it's gone. Some people just had to leave those towns and they became ghost towns. He knew something else. Remember J.S. Allen had just been in the bank? And the vault was open, the safe was open. The safe was open. So they could have had the money. For those of us who love Northfield, we say we are grateful to Joseph Lee Haywood for being faithful unto death. Right? That's it. Now. The city of Northfield in 1876 was a small industrious community. Home to Carleton College and St. Olaf's School, even then considered a college town. The community was a rail set on a productive river. The Ames Mills, on both sides of the river, were the leading industry in the town. Imagine, if you will, Northfield only some 20 years old. The buildings were mostly wood frame with a few made of brick and stone. The streets were unpaid. The homes of the residents were built close to the downtown area. People on the street were ordinary citizens, merchants, and farmers. They were peaceful, yet determined people, used to dealing with hardships and not to be taken advantage of. Contrast this in your mind, if you will, with the James Younger Bank. Who were these men from Missouri? Why were they so far from home? Why this bank raid in Northfield, Minnesota? Most of the gang members were Civil War veterans in their 20s and 30s, who had been loosely organized under the command of William Quantrill. When the war was over, this group of former guerrilla fighters continued to terrorize the country by robbing banks and trains. The first robbery blamed on the James Younger Gang was the Clay County Savings Bank at Liberty, Missouri in 1866. In the 10 years following their first robbery, 20 robberies had been committed by the James Younger Gang. Most of the robberies left innocent people dead or wounded. 
July 7, 1876, two months to the day before the Northfield robbery, the gang held up a Missouri Pacific train at a place called Rocky Cut near Otterville, Missouri. Between the Adams and U.S. Express companies, the gang made off with $18,300, worth $366,000 today. Shortly after the robbery, a new gang member by the name of Hobbs Carey was captured and turned state's evidence. The gang had intended to head for Texas, but once Carey's confession was published in the newspaper, they all headed north by rail for Minnesota. steal a horse and a saddle just outside of North Field to assist in their getaway. The chase would continue for several days when four of the six are either captured or killed near Medelia, Minnesota on September 21st. He's okay.